All right, we'd like to say good morning to everyone. Good morning. Both here in the sanctuary and out in YouTube and Facebook land, wherever you are. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, we're going to be doing later on. It is our hope and our prayer that things go well with you and for you and for your families and for all those things you do in support of the kingdom of God here on earth. It is of the utmost importance that we focus our prayers and good well wishes that you focus them in a very specifically <laughs> in a very specific manner uh, 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 if you're going to ask god to favor someone or something that one that person or that thing has to be focused or directed in service, service or in obedience to God. Not necessarily with regard to church and religious things, but God only blesses that which lines up with his word. Asking God to bless somebody that's disobedient to him is it's a, that in itself is a sin because the scripture warns us not to do that. There are those that are walking, talking, living, breathing abomination to everything that God has said in every command of God. You are not to pray for God to bless them. That is a sin. The, 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 there's a scripture where God tells you that for some, you don't even wish them God's speed. You disagree with them. You, you don't say God be with you to some people. The anti-God, the anti-Christ, the anti-love, those, those people whose very existence and everything about them that are contrary to God and you know it, you don't get to say God bless them. You pray for God's conviction to be on them and that they repent, but you don't be asking God to bless a whole bunch of things. And, and that, that covers pretty much everything. So when we ask God to smile upon you and favor you, that's in whatever you're doing that lines that is in obedience to his word. And like we say, we ask God to bless you, and blessings only come when we act in obedience to his word. Good morning, and... Again, the love of God abounds on all of us, and for that we are thankful. The peace from God abounds on us as much as we ask for by our behaviors, but it's good to be here. Yes, it is. It's good to be here. Woke up this morning with a reasonable portion of our right mind certain amount of health and strength that we can get up and the ability to get up and come to the house of worship, that place that is set aside specifically for the children of God, the family of God, to come and worship together, to come and receive of the, bread, the word of life, the bread of life, that spiritual food that is the word of God and the word from God. Our lesson for today, for April 14th, the second Sunday in April, is healed from a distance. Healed from a distance. 
Our lesson is coming from Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. And this is an interesting one. Uh, Jesus says something in here that people will sometimes gloss over. And, and I'll get into that exactly what Jesus said. It's a huge thing about this. This is the account of the Roman, one particular Roman centurion, a Gentile. Uh, 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 what Jesus said about him, he, it's a huge thing. But our devotional reading comes from Zechariah chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. If you, you can see that on your screen. Uh, but it is a wonderful lesson coming from the, again, unit lesson the, for this quarter, the second three months in the year. Unit lesson is the measure of faith, the amount of faith that is just shown. And again, faith is obedience to that which is written in the word of God or what is given to the individual by the conviction of God, the Holy Spirit. It's talking about how much is demonstrated. How much is demonstrated. We will see in these lessons someone who the people who believe what God says, period, like, like, like Abraham, God's told him to just go. I will tell you when you get there. Abraham believed God. He just went. He wasn't obedient on everything, every little thing, but that is how humans are. Even the best of us are obedient in every little thing. We don't have to be. Let us get on with our opening the, with the Sunday school model from 2 Timothy 2.15. And again, the Lord's Prayer in unison. We do that specifically to get our hearts and mind focused on the principles that God has established to direct your thoughts, to direct your mind in a very specific way. Sort of block out everything else and get on, get, in, get within these parameters. The purpose of, again, the devotion is to get all kind, every devotion in the church is to get everything outside of the Word of God blocked out and to get your mind within these narrow parameters so you aren't distracted by other stuff, so you can actually focus on receiving the, again, the the word of God, which is that spiritual food that we need. From 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly divided in the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15, the model of prayer in unison, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And again, we want to say good morning to everyone and welcome to Sunlight Missionary Baptist Church's Sunday School Review. Our lesson again is healed from a distance. Healed from a distance. And again, it's coming from Luke chapter 7. We will get into the specifics of this Roman centurion. That guys, there ain't a there isn't a whole bunch of discussion about him except what he believed. And Jesus tells you what he believed. And Jesus tells you in, in, in God, the Son, tells you exactly who this person is and exactly what he believed and exactly the, the, the measure, just how much faith 
how much belief in God that he had. Jesus tells you this. <laughs> Jesus tells you this. Jesus was speaking to the Israel, again, in the presence of the chosen people of God, the Israelites. Jesus was talking to them, relating to them the faith of a Gentile that dwarfed them. He was so far ahead of them, so much stronger than any of them. And I will, I'm going to remind you all the principles with regard to the Jews, the Israelites at that time, God's chosen people who were born and raised with the word of God and knowledge of the truth of the word of God, whether they internalized it or not, they had the truth presented to them from the time they were children. And the Gentiles who were not <laughs> raised with the truth from the time they were children. With regard to the Israelites, in order for them to become idol worshipers, they had to reject the truth in order to embrace a lie. The Gentiles who were not raised with the truth, they weren't, re there was no re absolute rejection of the truth of the word of God in them. In order for the Israelites to become idol worship, they had to harden their heart completely. <laughs> Gentiles, no hardened heart, no rejection of God. And again, this is a rejection of the truth of salvation. That, that's what the Israelites rejected in order to get to be idol worshipers. Here, that's, a, that's a big thing. So the Israelites were way, 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 way worse. A lost Israelite was way worse, way worse than a Gentile. Again, rejecting God, rejecting the truth from the time they were children in order to get to be an idol worship. Or not. That principle applies like this today, that there are people who are brought to church from the time they are children and taught the truth of salvation. They're taught the truth about Jesus Christ. From the time they are children. And then there's the vast majority of the world who are not. <laughs> Let's talk about America. 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 There's more churches than Van Camp's got pork and beans. They're all over the place. All over radio, television, all that stuff. The truth about Jesus Christ is promoted all over the place. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff also, but the truth, the gospel is promoted. And there's no law against it in America. Anybody can say there, there, that there is, but that person is a liar. And then there's a whole bunch of countries where, yeah, the gospel ain't promoted not nearly as much. So America, America is the bad, is the, 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 the you see the, you see the, you see the, the thing. Those who are raised up with the truth, Rejected those who ain't raised up with the truth, 
There is no comparison. <laughs> there is no comparison with these two. There is no comparing these two. One is way worse than the other. One is spiritually way worse than the other. Remember that. Always remember that. Remember that principle. Because that stuff applies whenever you see, when, whenever you read the scripture, that's in there somewhere. Whenever you're reading, the prof, reading about the prophets, that applies. And you need to understand that. And you don't get to reject that. You don't get to make excuses up for the Israelites. You don't get to make excuses for them. Because that puts you on the opposite side of God. That puts you opposed to God. What's, what's going on in Israel right now and what is going to be going on in Israel in the future, it's not because Israel is good. They are not. Not because the rest of the world is bad. They are not. <laughs> You need to understand something. There is God. There is the truth. And you line up with God or against God, period. Remember, most of the world, the vast majority of the people on the planet, the vast majority of people in leadership roles, all in every government, most of them are anti-God. They're not devilish in their religion, but they're anti-word of God in their actions and behaviors. Sometimes there's a reason, oftentimes not so much. But our lesson, our, we're going to start off from Zechariah. The, the devotion read is from Zechariah chapter 8, verses 18 through 23. Uh, and this is this is the prophet Zechariah relaying information to the children of Israel. Uh, uh, this is again Israel, the Israelites. Their duty is to spread the worship of the one true God to the land of Canaan, so that to get the, should the, the the Canaanites to turn to Salvation through the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the only true, real God there is. Everything else, their idols are just made up. They're make believe. They're fictional things that they made up themselves. Idolatry is basically worship of self. Any and every form of idolatry, any and every religion, this is important now. In any, any and every religion that is not focused on God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in the exact manner that the Bible prescribes and the Bible rightly divided, any religion that is not exactly that is opposed to that. It's sort of how it works. The absolute authority and sovereignty of God sort of makes it so. No, no, there is no fault, no accidentally false religion. You, you, you can't be a, a false preacher, a false prophet by accident. It doesn't work that way. You have to choose to be that. But again, the prophet Zechariah, one of the many prophets sent to warn Israel to repent and get right with God and do what God says. 
not just so that they could they themselves could be saved from eternal damnation but their children because when you turn against god and turn to idolatry your children and your grandchildren are going to follow, probably going to follow in the along the way that you again it's natural children generally follow after their parent it's not necessarily always so now, but in the past, that is the way it was. And, and all those Canaanite people that they were supposed to be teaching uh, the truth to, so they could be saved from eternal damnation, is basically in the heart, in their heart. When the Israelite, any individualite, any individual rejected. God in favor of idols, they were basically telling God that they wanted everyone else. They wanted everyone else to go to hell. See, that individual choice for salvation affects everybody else. It does affect everybody else. It is your duty. It is the duty of, of, of everyone to try and get everyone else to take the necessary action to get friends and acquaintances, those people that you interact with, to get them saved from eternal damnation. But at least to tell them about Jesus so they can choose for themselves. You have to give them the choice. Just like God gave you the choice. Just like everyone since Adam and Eve have been given the choice. You can't make them do anything, but they have to have the choice given to them. That's our duty. Again, it's the Israelites and following after idolatry was basically removing the choice. <laughs> and you can't say it enough. You just have to understand just how often it is for people to want their children to end their heart, to desire that their children spend eternity in hell. And don't kid yourself. They grew up, one more time, they grew up being taught the wages of sin is eternal damnation. They know what the consequences for not getting saved is. They know that. That's never been a secret. And they knew that they knew it exactly true. They grew up knowing the exact truth once again they didn't necessarily have to embrace it in their own hearts but the truth is the truth the truth is not personal it is absolute the truth is the word of God is absolute your personal stuff don't override that so so no one was under any under the misunderstanding misunderstanding that this may or may not be true. They could say that, but no, that's not how it works. Now, uh, that is the introduction. Zechariah, Prophet Zechariah, talking to, again, a bunch of hard-headed Israelites, God is warning them. Again, that is what all the prophets in the Old Testament, all the prophets were warning Israel and Judah about one thing, trying to head off one event or giving the Israel, the children of Israel, the opportunity to repent. To, at, the, at the very least, at the very least, to repent of their desire 
for their children and grandchildren and great great grandchildren to re remove that desire for them all to go to hell. Rejecting God, the, the consequences, the after effects do not change. The after effects of rejection, the rejection of salvation, the after effects and how it affects other people that you interact with. The after effects do not change. They are the same. Therefore, the consequences are the same. The after effects are the absolute worst thing that can happen to a human. Therefore, the punishment to that individual is the worst thing that can happen to a human. All right. For today, our, the key verse from Luke chapter 7. Again, this, this, this particular account about the centurion is fantastic. This, this is what Luke chapter 7, verse 7 says. This is the word from that particular centurion. And we, we will look in the scripture where you see how that thing occurred. He said, Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. This is the word that the centurion sent to Jesus. He said, I am not worthy to come to you. He knows that. This guy, this guy understands. He says, but I'm not worthy to come into you. I'm not even worthy to be in your presence. I know this. I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. I know this. This is not a secret. Here's something you all need to when you when you when you when you read. See, it's talking about um, in this particular in this particular instance that come into my house thing. Okay, when you look in the Bible and you see where Jesus came to a place, there is no one. Look in the Bible now. Look and see. There is no one. that invited Jesus, they did not ask Jesus to come to their house. Look and see that. No one asked Jesus to come to their house. This guy understands it. You will see that no one actually asked Jesus, Jesus, come to my house. Jesus always directed to which house he was going. Jesus picked the house that he would go to. That's an interesting thing. Again, the understate, the heart of man recognizes God and <laughs> recognizes that, yeah, God is holy, even under the best of conditions. We are not worthy to be in the presence of God. Our life, it does not reflect the holiness. Our life does not reflect as something suitable for the holy God to enter into. That is, again, the recognition of truth. Not has nothing to do with salvation but the recognition of who we are, period. God is the one that decides that he will come in and sup with us. He's the one that decides that he will come in and sup with us. In the physical universe, no one actually invited him. Spiritually, everyone has to invite him in. 
well, not so much invite him in, but let him in. But he's the one that chose. Neither I am myself worthy to come unto thee. And he says, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. There's more to the account, but he says, you don't have to come unto me. I don't have to come unto you. If you say it, it's a done deal. If you just say it, it's over. That's it. I'm not worthy to come to you. I'm not worthy to have you come to me. But I need this thing. And if you say that thing be done, mm -hmm. it's done right, right. by the word of God. Mm -hmm. This guy understand that God said, let there be light and made it so. God spoke reality obeyed. God speaks, reality is ordered according to his word. That is what this centurion recognizes. Plenty of people wanted Jesus to come to their house to heal this person. Do this, do that. <laughs> they wanted their personal problem solved. And the, for that reason, they wanted, they would have Jesus come to their house. Their daughter is sick and they, and they need a healing. So Jesus come over to my house and heal my daughter. See, this guy, this centurion says, say it and it's done. Ramo. Again. A very different understanding. And we go back to Zechariah, to where this and this is the comparison now. The Israelites, who, who will soon be overrun and destroyed, Israel is going to be destroyed by the Assyrian army, the entire those 10 tribes, the land of those 10 tribes, completely laid to waste. Almost all of their fighting men killed and the old and the infirm left. The young children taken off to another country and everything pretty much just yeah, devastated. by the judgment of God. The same thing would happen to Judah later on by the Babylonians, simply because they would not repent and get right with God and do that, again, perform their evangelistic duties to the Canaanites or to their children. And that's just awful. But this is part of the, the, the uh, prophecy of Zechariah. Because again, God, even though Israel and Judah was coming under his judgment, because Israel, again, they were just rejecting, in rejecting God, the entire truth of the word of God, which is the source of hope for the future, they reject that too. Peace in a time of trouble, they reject that too. The hedge of protection that God provides, they reject that too. And all of that stuff, if you taught your children about Jesus, and if they, they receive Jesus, even if you don't, then they get the benefits of the power of the sovereign God. You can continue to be miserable and suffering, but your children will have peace. And that little bitty love thing that you're supposed to have in your heart for your children, at least they can have that. 
but the absolute deceptiveness of the nature of man lets you know that people don't actually have love for their children. It, it's not. That thing is inputted into us by God, but it can be overridden. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 18 through 23 says this. And the word of the Lord of hosts came unto me, saying, this is Zechariah, a prophet and a priest. He's a Levite. It says, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth and the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love the truth and peace. The word of God, commandments of God, are the word of truth. When you embrace it, you get the peace of God, that shelter, hedge of protection around you and all of that stuff, all the benefits of being a child of God. This is what the prophets desire. This is what God's desire for Israel is. This is what the prophets desire for Israel is. And like we say, the prophet can want all they can want and pray and fast and this, that, and the other. The preachers, the pastors can watch and pray and fast and this, that, and the other. The prophet ain't the thing that matters. The, the prophet can't save the Israelites against the Israelites' will. The Israelites don't want to be saved themselves. Yeah, a prophet can pray to his nose be buttermilk. Ain't gonna change nothing. Pastors is exactly the same thing. Today it's exactly the same thing. If the congregation does not want, does not want the goodness of God, it really doesn't matter what the pastor does. Because God is all about saving the people. God is all about saving the congregation. That's God about saving people. The prophets are saved already. Pastors are saved already. Jesus' pastors are saved already. <laughs> Not everybody that says they are. The, 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 and here's the thing. As far as the church, the actual church, the actual church, those in the congregation that are actually saved, those who carry out the great commandment, the great commission, as long as you're telling somebody about Jesus, don't you know that it, nothing you do is going to make a difference to a lost person who will not receive Jesus. It's their choice. It's their choice to reject salvation. Once again, in the United States, in the United States, except for a few young children that are growing up that ain't got old enough to realize what the uh, uh, teachings about Jesus are. Again, those are young children, babies and children who have not gotten old enough and learned enough yet for it to click in their head. The Jesus of the Bible and what the Bible says about the Jesus of the Bible. That's an age thing. Because pretty much all adults have heard about Jesus and who the Bible says Jesus is. That is the absolute truth. 
They can choose to reject or accept. That's on them. The church has never, ever saved anyone. The church's duty is to present the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. <laughs> The lost actually do have to, of their own free will, choose to take that gift and receive it into themselves. You can't shove it down their throat. It don't work like that. And the word of the Lord of hosts came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, we talked about the fast, says, Therefore, love the truth and peace. Verse 20. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Prophecy. This is about prophecy of something that's coming. Now, that you want to know what happened after Zechariah? I can tell you, we know many other prophets are in Israel. They're spreading the truth of the word of God all over the place. We know for a fact that Israel did not listen. We know that they didn't listen. Not that they weren't told, not that they weren't warned, but they did not listen. So when the Bible, when the Word of God, the prophecy of God is talking about something that shall happen, it ain't talking about then. It ain't talking about then. Because it didn't happen then. It ain't talking about now, because it certainly ain't happening now. And when it's talking about the Israelites, it's talking about the Israelites. Now, the principles apply to individuals. Israelite, the Israelites, the first evangelist, and the church, the second evangelist, evangelist being the witness, one given the truth of the word of God to spread. Them two are not treated the same because <laughs> they are not the same. Verse 22, yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. Now you got people doing all sorts of tours of Jerusalem. They want to go to the Holy Land to walk in this path and this, that, and the other. That ain't it. Even during the time of Solomon, which is way before this time of Zechariah, when people would come to hear Solomon, leaders from all over the globe who learned about Solomon would come to listen to Solomon talk. That ain't what it's talking about. <laughs> that ain't what it's talking about. When it's talking here, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord today. Those who worship the Lord, worship him in spirit and truth, wherever they are, wherever they are, that's where you worship the Lord at, from your heart, in your heart. This is talking about something else. There will come a time when Jesus establishes his kingdom on earth you will go to Jerusalem <laughs> because that's where Jesus 
Yeah, that's where the throne of Christ on earth will be. So yeah, there shall be from all over the globe, from all over the planet, people going to Jerusalem. Specifically, because that's where Jesus was actually going to manifest. Verse 23, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Okay, we already did that. Well, no, I didn't. Verse 23, thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations. Again, languages uh, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Yes, God will, God will be with the Jews during the thousand year reign. Because during that time, all the Israelites, every single one of them, will be saved. It will be Jesus sitting on the throne, and under them, in charge of all humans on the planet, the Israelites. And under them, everybody else. That's what the, the, the uh, Jesus' entrance into, into on, on Palm Sunday, that's what the Israelites thought was going to happen. He's going to establish that right then. After his resurrection, his, his, his apostles asked him, okay, Lord, are you going to establish your kingdom now, right then? No, that comes later. He told them, no, that comes later. But again, that's what they thought. Because, again, the scripture tells you this is going to happen. That shell. It's going to happen. And that's where it starts out. We have heard that God is with you. This is, and this is talking about the, 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 the Gentiles become subject to Jesus through the Jews at that particular time. And at no time in history since has this manifested has this scripture shown itself to be true? At no time in human history as yet. Again, the book of Revelations tell you that that's going to happen after tribulation and great tribulation when Jesus establishes his kingdom on earth for a thousand years, physical kingdom. That will happen. Then. But, but, the, but that's the, 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 the devotional reading, devotional message. And again, there are all these principles and examples that are written into the Bible for you to know and understand. Understand the truth behind the principles because they apply to every generation. <laughs> they apply to every generation. There's a general truth that applies to all mankind, and there's an individual, a particular truth. See how that applies to the individual in the heart and mind and life of the individual. Our lesson for today, talking about the measure of faith. Again, how much faith is being demonstrated here? How much faith is being shown? How much believe that what thus saith the Lord just is? It, whatever God says is. Period. God in his absolute truth and then way separated, way below this, you have people thinking what they want to think. Above them, but still above those people thinking what they want to think and leaning on their own understanding are those that are trying to seek to understand what thus saith the Lord and rightly divide and get understanding, get wisdom of what thus saith the Lord. What God wants you to know and understand 
from these principles and examples. There are people endeavoring, trying, are actually actively growing closer to the Lord by again, eating the uh, uh, spiritual food, the word of God, taking it more and more, getting more and more understanding. They're growing spiritually. It happens. <laughs> it just does. We have two outlines. Uh, 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 <clears throat> one of them is faith's request. Faith's request. The person of faith. The person who believes that what God says is. What God says is. And you, you, you. Contrast this centurion, this Roman centurion, this is one of the only white people in the Bible. There's only like a handful of them, and they're the Romans. <laughs> And it was only, only in the last, what, 80, 90 years in America. Not, it, not, it wasn't too, mid, too much, too many decades ago that people of Italy, people of Italy and from Italy, Caucasian Americans did not consider them Caucasians. Americans really messed up. <laughs> Americans are really messed up. We study the history of coloring in America. Like, like everybody that came from European nations to America were not considered white. They were considered whatever nationality they were and mistreated the exact same. Not nearly as bad in some instances, but they were mistreated just the same. That's America. She messed up like that. She always been messed up like that. The only group that didn't that didn't get mistreated like that was the uh, first group that came over. They got treated with love and compassion so that they didn't die out during the winter. The nice people that were already here showed love and compassion to them and prevented them from dying out. That particular thing gets all twisted around All right, this is, this is the account of Luke. This is one of the accounts of Luke. Luke is a, a Gentile. Luke's a Gentile. He's not an Israelite either. He's a doctor. He's traveling around and he's with Jesus, giving his account. This is part of his account. Uh, <clears throat> the first outline is Luke chapter 7, verse 1 through 5. Fate's request. This is what it says. Now, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. Jesus went back to the city from which his home base was at. It's from, from Capernaum. This is where he left to go here and came back. Went there and came back. Went there and came back. Went there and came back. He said, as a certain centurion's servant, centurion, the Roman military leader, one of his servants, who was dear to him, the Roman military leader had love and compassion for his servant. We'll find that it's all of them. 
the servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. This servant, whom the centurion, who was dear to his heart, was going to die. Look here now. He's going to die. Period. There's nothing that can be done. Death is a certainty. And to be honest, the, that, that, that the, 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 the servant was ready to die, that the servant was ready to die, the servant was probably miserable and in a lot of pain and probably not pleasant. <laughs> His, whatever was wrong with him probably was not pleasant. That the servant was ready to die. Verse 3, and when he heard, the centurion heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews. The elders of the Jews. In, 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 uh, the elders are the older men, the older, wiser men that teaches the young men. The purpose of older people, the purpose, the God-given stated purpose of senior people is to teach younger people. The scriptural purpose of senior people is to teach younger people who are willing to be taught. That, that's going to, that sort of implied. Who are willing to be taught. Who are willing to learn. Who want to know. Not to teach them what they want, but what thus saith the Lord. That's a thing. To relay the, the, the benefits of other people's lived experiences. The benefits of having been alive these 60 or 70 years or 80 years to have seen how the world has changed, but humans have not. How technology has changed but the basic heart of mankind has not. To see that in every generation, every new generation thinks they're new and they're the first ones. They're the first one who has experienced these problems. The principles of human existence are the same. The conditions that any individual may be living under in whatever country, in whatever time, the conditions change, but the principles of human life remain. Somebody that's old enough knows that. He sent unto him the centurion sent to Jesus the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. The centurion heard about Jesus, so he asked the elders of the Jews, would you get this now? He asked the elder of the Jews, the chosen people, of God to go and ask that prophet sent by God to, if he would kindly come and heal his servant who is again miserable and near death. Verse 4 says, and when they came to Jesus, these elders, they besought him instantly, saying, they, yes, the elders 
did a, did as a centurion asked. Because he did ask. Because <laughs> he has no command over them. He asked humbly. Not for his sake, but for the people, the one that he loved sake. His servant, yes, as his servant, he loves his servant. They besought Jesus instantly, saying that he, that the centurion, was worthy for whom he should do this. Here's the thing. Remember the Israelites. They are the ones that are bigots. <laughs> They are the ones that think they are better than everybody else. They know this. The elders know this. But they don't know Jesus. So when they go to Jesus to act on behalf of a Gentile, yes, they have to say this particular Gentile Pay close attention to this now. This Gentile is one of the good ones. He's one of the good ones. That's what they're saying. <laughs> Don't do that. Do you not understand? Do you not get? Just how bad the Israelites are. Because that's what they're saying. This guy is one of the good ones. He's worthy. What does that mean? The rest of them, the rest of them ain't one of the good ones. Listen up. Ethnicity, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> that is bigotry. For the Israelites, it's bigotry. It's religious and spiritual bigotry. Six of one half dozen the other. In the United States, with skin color, it manifests as racism. That same thing. Yeah, he's one of the good ones. She's one of the good ones. Pure devil. Pure devil. But these, these, these guys going, they, they go to Jesus as if Jesus is like them. They go to him like he's one of them. Like their personal biases and bigotries and personal shortcomings, yeah, God has them too. Granted, they don't really understand who Jesus is. They just know that Jesus can do stuff and they want Jesus to do stuff. <laughs> but they're, they, they just assume he's just like them. They know how messed up they are. They know how messed up they are. In their hearts, they know that. So they assume, and this is a human principle, humans, there's all kinds of crazy people think Jesus is just like them. Jesus is on their side against these other people who ain't the good ones. <clears throat> They said that he was worthy that he for whom he should do this. For he loved our nation, the centurion, loved Israel, and he has built us a synagogue. He has built us a place of worship. He has built us a place of worship this is the thing. The temple 
is God's. It is the official authorized place of worship at this time. The synagogues were what the Israelites did. That's, that's their work. Jesus speaks about it. They go to worship in their synagogues. His synagogue. He didn't establish that. But it's fine. As long as the word of God goes forth, it accomplishes God's purpose. But they, they, they're speaking about it. Yes. He loves Israel and he built us a synagogue. Speaking, they're talking this guy up because God's got love in his heart. That's the request. That is their request. And that is a centurion's request. This Jesus in, in verse 6 through 8, 6 through Acts 6 through 10, Jesus decides, okay. Now, once again, remember, Jesus is God. But Jesus is going to demonstrate to them, because they you see what they're saying. And, and again, we talk a, we talk a whole bunch about the implications of what they say, what this actually means. When they say this, it means this, this, and this. It does not mean this, this, and this. Reason. Reason it out. Think it out. What it means. Faith reward. Verse 6 through 10. This is what it says. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was, he was now not far from the house, when they got close to the house, Jesus and the elders of the Jews Jesus said, okay, let's go. Now, when they were now not far from the house, Jesus and the elders started towards the house. Before they got to the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Here's the thing. This is happening. There, there may be messengers running hither and yonder. They may have messengers running about that, that, that relate to the centurion. Uh, 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 yes, they have, he has decided to come. And when Jesus decided, okay, I'll go with you, there probably there may have been a messenger to run back to the house to alert the centurion. He's on his way. Possible. That's possible. Makes sense to me. Not, 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 not a thing. Actually, it is a thing, but it doesn't say that. What the Bible says that when they were not far from the house, before they got there, the centurion sent friends to him, to Jesus, saying unto him, Lord, that Lord, that word is God. That is the word uh, for God. <laughs> not God, but uh, 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 uh. By, by, by default, the God, the one and only. Lord, trouble not thyself. Don't, don't inconvenience yourself by walking over here. For I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Lord, creator of heaven and earth, thou who art holy, I am not worthy for you to come into my house. My house isn't worthy for you to come into my house. My house is dirty. 
We know that you ain't. You are holy and we are not. Absolute truth. Wherefore, he said, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. That's why I didn't come unto you myself. <laughs> because I know of whom I am. I know what I am. And I do believe who you am. He says, I am not worthy to come unto you. I know this, but, but say in a word and my servant shall be healed. When you look at the other, there are other things of healing, uh, other things about healing. They said, uh, like, like with the, not so much healing, but with the actual resurrection of Lazarus, when Martha told them, Martha, yes, I think it was Martha, when one of the sisters told them, Lord, we know that if you had been here, our brother would not have died. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Yes, knowing that your physical presence, you could have stopped him from dying. If you had been here, if you had been here, you had to have had to have been here. Like he doesn't have absolute authority over everything all the time. Like he isn't everywhere in every when all the time. A human limitation placed on an infinite God. They had the Israelites, because of all their learning and seeing and their disobedience, they had limitations. They, they chose to limit that they oppose their human limitations and their human understandings on the infinite God. If you had been here, if thou wilt say, if, if thou will say, the centurion doesn't say, if you will say, he says, say. Now, if you are willing, <laughs> he said, say. He knows about God. He understands who God is. And he doesn't let his unworthiness override the goodness of God which is that if stuff that lots of them was used. Which is, the, again, that if stuff that a lot of other ones use. It says, but say a word and my servant shall be healed. And this is, this is the understanding. This is where he demonstrates that in the beginning, this is the God that he's talking about. This is the Lord that he speaks about. That he understands, that he knows Period. The one that said, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And it was so that the word of God is. The universe is because God said it. His presence is not required. His physical presence is not required. Okay, let me fix that. <laughs> Because God is everywhere and everywhere. Like with Jesus, he doesn't actually have to come to a place. He doesn't have to lay on hands. The entire universe is his. 
every atom all the time is subject to him. Jesus didn't have to come there. Jesus didn't have to spit on and touch or any of that stuff. He can just say it and make it so. For I am a man set under authority, having unto me soldiers. He says, and I say unto one, I say unto one of these things that are under me. I say unto him, go, and he go. I tell him to go, and he go. And to another, come, and he cometh. Everything that's under my authority answers to me. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. This guy is understanding that his word to people, people obey him because of his authority. The entire universe, everything in everybody is under God, <laughs> is under Christ. That whatever he says is. It doesn't matter how, how miserable, how much suffering that his servant is doing. When Jesus says something, problem solved. It's, it's over. Whatever God says is. This Roman centurion understands this. Understand God in a way that the Israelites accepts. God in a way that the Israelites do not. When Jesus heard these things, what the, his understanding and his reasoning, get this now, these apostles heard this. His disciples and those that are falling around him wanting to be healed heard this. These Jewish elders heard this. This is who this is being, this is who this is being said to. This is who that is for. All this is for them. This is for us. Because <laughs> the centurion, he's good to go. He's good. Verse 9, this is what Jesus said. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about. He turned and went on a bit about his business. Jesus actually honored the centurion's heart that he's unworthy to come into his house. In it, Jesus said, come to his house. It might not have been the most pleasant thing for the centurion. It's like a, 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 the, the, the presence of the holy God, the holiness of God, when it's not being masked, is too much for humans. <laughs> it's too much for humans. That's why flesh and blood and no unregenerated, no person that, no person doesn't have life like God has it, no spirit that has not been regenerated and given life and life like God has it can be in the presence of God. It is utter misery and torture. Yeah. Turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, who did they talk to? He, who is Jesus talking to? Them. The centurion's good to go. None of this was for his benefit. None of this was for his benefit, but for the crowd, for his apostles, for the elders. He said, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Now this statement is huge. 
because this statement covers Israel, the man Israel, his, third, his 12 sons, everybody that follows. Among the Israelites, period, among all of them, among all the, remember who's talking, and that whatever he says is. <laughs> you don't get to limit what he says. Not in Israel. History of the Israelites. All kinds of people. Prophets and this, that, and the other. But in all of them, no one understood. No one had the understanding and acceptance of God so purely as this centurion. God doesn't have to come to my house. You don't have to come to my house. Please don't come to my house. <laughs> Please don't come to my house. I don't want that. It's like, a, but he said, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sent. The elders saw the faith of the centurion, how great it was, and how that God honored the faith of the Gentile. That Gentile, despite their bigotry, and again, remember they said, Jesus, this is one of the good ones. That's them. That's their human shortcomings. That human shortcoming, and, 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 and that human shortcoming is alive and well. And what you see is how different how far removed from the truth of God that that is. Completely separate from the truth of the word of God. In the word of God, again, it covers all time. It, it, it applies to every generation. And when you understand the principles, you can see it in everyday situations. You can see it in global circumstances. You can see it in the hearts and minds of men, women, boys, and girls. And see how God, you can see also how God is going to deal with the individuals thereof. And you can see who it is that many of them actually serve. And again, you can see what they believe about God. If they believe the God of the Bible as is written, or if they believe what they want to believe about God. Uh, what they, people believing what they choose to believe, the kind of God that they want to believe in, that's a, that's a, hang on, let me see, that's a, that's virtual, those are virtual atheists. Virtual atheists are those who define God or accept God in ways that are inconsistent with his nature. 
They don't deny the existence of God, but they present a God who is not capable of being much help to sinful men, or they think of him as, well, that their, their human shortcomings apply to him. Yeah, they, they, they are atheists because they, again, they reject God the way He is. This is, the, this is, the, this is they, they want Him to be like them. Yeah. Not new. Again, we thank you all for joining. We hope something as we know something that has been said will be of some spiritual gain and benefit to you. Uh, we say that you all have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful week. We'll join you in about. Uh, five minutes or so for our sermon. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful week. Or may take a little bit. <clears throat>